Okay. So good morning. Um, my name is Joe Nuspel. Um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm a Yank. So you're like, well, what's this guy doing here in, in Galway? And um, it, it really has sort of been um, my home away from home. I think this is my seventh trip to Galway over the years, so um, I really feel a, a connection. Um, when I was asked to give the, the keynote, I was a little reluctant at first based on some previous trips to Ireland. So I was here during Ophelia. I was also here during Storm Brian, and um, then I was here during the Beast from the East. So I was also concerned that my coworkers in Dublin would be like, don't come, because every time you, that you're here, there is this weather disaster. So please, stay away. But then I remembered that Galway is beautiful. And I actually was talking to some people last night, and I've actually gone in, and actually yesterday I went in uh, into the bay um, at uh, the Black Rock Diving Tower, and so I'm actually more Gal Galwean uh, than some other people that live in Galway because they actually haven't jumped into the bay. So, um, yeah, so my, my talk is about, um, you know, is, is about reflections on a lifetime of learning. And I have a confession to make. I'm not here to bestow wisdom upon you. Um, one, that's preposterous. Um, two, that's really arrogant to say that I have the wisdom um, to give unto all of you. Um, I can't tell you what will work for you. Um, your wisdom comes from your uh, life experience, your journey. And, you know, it, it's really looking at, um, looking at your life and your experiences to figure out where that wisdom comes from. So I'm from the Pacific Northwest, the land of trees. And as you can see, here I am with my with my kids um, at Bashful Goth and at Bubza 101. So uh, on this trip, uh, it, was, it was a really interesting thing. We were talking about uh, and talking about how uh, my youngest had just turned 13 and had gotten, you know, they were really excited about, you know, getting social media. Now they're 13, they have social media. And I was thinking back to when I was a kid and going, man, how, how times have changed. And the, because uh, when I, I was getting some feedback there. So when I was 13, I was really looking forward because on my 13th birthday, I got a 10 speed bike. And I was like, oh, how the times have changed. And, and I was thinking about this after for a while, and I was thinking, well, what did that mean to me? What did that 10-speed bike mean to me? And I was thinking about that, and I said, well, before I would ride my single-seat bike over to my friend Alan's house to play video games, and it would take like 45 minutes. Now with the 10-speed, it only took 25 minutes, and that allowed me to connect to my friends uh, in a way that, you know, to improve that, and I was like, wait a minute, this is the same sort of thing that my kids are wanting to do by getting social media. They're connecting to their friends. So I was just looking at the things, the motivations are the same, but the things, the actual implementation is different. So, so that's sort of what the, the really sparked the idea of this thought. So I actually found out when I was, when I was, uh, giving the, this, uh, preparing this talk or, or giving a preview to people, that actually Oliver Goldsmith is actual uh, Irish author, so I didn't know this at the time when I found this quote, so uh, here's a little tie-in to Ireland here. But the, the true wisdom consists of tracing effects to their causes. So in technical fields, in your jobs, you have post-mortems or root cause analysis or whatever your organization calls them, but you're trying to figure out how did we get here to, the, to where you're at. And I took this approach um, to my own life and my own experiences to figure out how did I get here with the things that I know and do. So if we look at that for the root cause analysis, what does this trace back to? How did I get here? Well, 
It was this guy, my dad, Joe Sr. So he is an insurance auditor. He was an insurance auditor by profession. Um, but he was more than that. He was a, he was a handyman, a sausage maker, and he taught me a lot. I just didn't know it yet. Uh, you know, he gave me this big solid foundation for doing DevOps, but he wasn't even in the field. And, and it was just learning of those things, those, the, um, the, those different skills and such. So one of the, I guess the first lesson that I remember um, that I look back on and go, this was a, a, a definitive thing for me, was going with my dad to get an oil change. And I just remember that because my dad asked me, he goes, well, I'm going to go get an oil change. Do you want to come with? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Now, I was in it really because I knew that we were going to get Burger King on the way home. I didn't you know, really want to go do an oil change, go with my dad to have an oil change. And I remember that he was going in, and the, after the oil change, they used to come out and give the stickers, and they would write the date, today's date on it and the current mileage. There we go. Huh. Um, the, the current mileage on there. And my dad, when they were sitting there writing on the sticker, and he's like, no, 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 no. Just put three months from now. Add 3,000 miles to the mileage. He goes, no, no, that's how we do it. He goes, no, no, no. I'm telling you, please do this for me. And then I remember one time he just like would grab the sticker and do it and he wrote it out himself and then put it on his windshield. And I was like a little embarrassed by it. But then I, you know, later I'd asked him about this. And he goes, well, when I'm sitting there driving along, I just want to be able to look at the sticker, look at my mileage and do a simple comparison. I didn't want to have to do math every time in my, in my head. So, uh, I, you know, and later on this changed to now, if you see the stickers, um, last time I saw the stickers, it would be the next service due. Now, was this due to my dad? Mm, probably not. Uh, I'd probably like royalties off of that, that whole change of things, how they did. But it really got the idea of making things easier for yourself. And if you have a choice of, of doing that, you could do that, that calculation once, one time up front and then go through and do those things again. But it, it also taught me to sort of question standards um, and look for ways to improve your own processes, what you do on an everyday basis. Sounds like continuous improvement. So now let's talk about sausage. I know uh, that's, a, that's a great uh, segue. Um, there's a lot of quotes out there about sausage that are kind of disparaging. They usually are like, not in a positive light, they're like, sausage is like, why? You don't want to see how it's being made. But as a sausage maker, um, I, I take great pride in my work. So this was um, one of the, uh, a quote that I liked it. it. Sausage is a great deal like life. You get out of it what you put into it. So I'm going to, you're here at a DevOps Days conference and you're gonna learn about sausage making. So, <laughs> I, I just give you a basis so you know what I'm, to, to give a basis so you know what I'm talking about. So, how, what do you do when you're making sausage? You trim the meat, you grind the meat, you mix in spices, you form, you cook and enjoy. That's sausage making in a nutshell. Uh, in this setting precedence, um, this is a sausage press. When you're actually making sausage links, um, you will actually take the meat, put it into this uh, contraption, which is a, uh, a sausage press. You put the meat in there, um, you put casings on the tube coming out, and you crank it. You crank to push the meat out. So, this is what uh, my the, the kitchen growing up looked like several times a year. Um, it, Uh, the kitchen was transformed into a meat processing plant um, where we would sit there and be making uh, 
getting a bunch of meat and making up sausage. My dad used to sell it to his coworkers. Usually, uh, we usually had a big order before uh, Easter and would be delivering it. And what this really taught me um, is uh, about pipelines. You know, it's an assembly line when you're making sausage, but that's the same thing as your um, deployment pipeline. Um, you need to have good handoffs. Uh, every person in your pipeline has an important role, and the system as a whole needs to run smooth. Uh, and also, the speed of your overall pipeline, pipeline is dictated by the slowest component. Now, so in here, um, the picture, here's my dad, is actually cutting, uh, pinching off the links to figure out um, my nephew is actually cranking the sausage and my youngest is actually twirling it up and, and putting it out there. So you could sort of think of my, uh, my nephew who's, who's cranking away as development. They're cranking out features, you know, left, you know, as fast as they can. Well, if my dad is, is operate or, you know, QA, say, out of your pipeline, um, if they're going too fast and while he's doing it, it's going, the casing is going to burst and you're gonna have raw meat and a mess all over the place. It's the same sort of thing in your pipelines that development is going faster than what Q QA can uptake. They're not gonna be able to keep up and you're gonna have a mess. Uh, you're gonna have a mess. So this is a quote from Ben Franklin. Tell me and I'll forget. I'm not going to touch. There, there's, there's gremlins. Where were those gremlins, Stardust? Um, tell me, I'll forget. Show me, and I may remember. Involve me, and I learn. Uh, this really, uh, it was, it was something that I, I really, um, really resonated with me um, because growing up as part of this whole sausage making process, even as you know, six, seven years old, there was jobs for us to do during this time. And uh, here's my youngest and um, making sausage at, my, uh, at, at home. And you start, I really thought about this, and you're, you're starting your junior members uh, of your team right away. Give them responsibilities and set them up for success. Um, you don't want to just say, you know, give them a task that they're going to fail at because you're not going to be able to build the confidence uh, of going through and doing that if they, if they fail. And the other part of it is, is really if you never give them responsibility, they're never going to learn. They have to be given that responsibility. And if they make a mistake, uh, it's, a, it's a perfect opportunity to sit there and explain to them why things are, diff are done a certain way. However, you might be surprised. They might question you and say, well, what about doing it this way? And you know, you never know where inspiration can come from. So here's here's what you when I talked about sausage making, the one step is that you mix in the spices. And I, I thought this is the perfect metaphor because I hear people talk about uh, you know about oh well, we'll just sprinkle some DevOps onto the organization and hire a few DevOps people and it's and it's transformed. Well, you can't just sprinkle it on. If on here, like the sausage, yeah, it's the top part, you're gonna cook that. These, this is actually breakfast sausage and making patties. So you're gonna actually cook the part that's gonna get all, it's gonna get all charred. The, um, uh, the sugar in there is gonna burn. It's not gonna be very tasty and it's gonna be very bland on the, the bottom side, just like in your organizations. You really have to mix it in to your organization. You just can't hire a DevOps team and that'll solve the problems for your whole thing. So once you mix it in, DevOps into your organization, the teams will start organizing and you start in bite-sized chunks and it gets bigger and bigger throughout. So another part of my life uh, growing up, I worked as uh, I, w I worked with my dad doing carpentry. Um, we did 
a lot of, you know, we did cabinet making and such. And this, this was a, a sign that was at my, uh, my secondary school wood shop. Uh, it sat on there. I cut it twice and it's still too short. Um, and I, I always thought it was funny because people always questioned the sign and would say, well, you, if you cut the board and it's too short and then you go and cut it again, you're cutting a shorter board. No, I'm like, no, you're grabbing another piece of lumber off the stack and cutting it again and it's too short. When you have to explain it to people, it, it, it doesn't work. But I, anyways, it was just funny how uh, Th this stuck with me. Uh, I was doing the slides, and I I saw I came across this. And I'm like, I remember that from school. That was on the that was on the wall. So it was kind of a, a neat flashback. So the one thing in in woodworking and carpentry is you measure everything. Hmm, sounds like sort of like DevOps. You're having you know you have cams. You have culture auto automation measurement and sharing. So there, you've got one of the things, and it was really, um, so this was, uh, you know, when people came up with, you know, DevOps and it was starting to spread around, they're like, oh, you measure it. I'm like, of course, that makes perfect sense because I had this sort of, you know, regimented into me from my previous careers. So, uh, you know, you're measuring everything. Uh, the other th great thing on here is, um, in, in, the, in the blow up on here is that uh, where they're actually measuring, doing a measurement and starting from from one on the tape measure. And it was, and it was because sometimes the, you know, you're working in a wood shop and the, the end of the tape measure gets, you know, smashed or something so you don't have a good baseline. So you start at one so you have a good baseline. And that's really about what you're doing too is when you're do, starting to do measurements, you have to figure out your baseline as well. So again, it was just reiterating concepts that I, that I see in DevOps has physical representations in other industries. So this was, this is uh, one of the saws that my dad had in the, in the shop, this, uh, this Sears Craftsman, you know, radial arm saw. And uh, this bad boy was in, the, in his garage shop. And whenever he turned it on, it would dim the lights in the house. It, the amp draw was that much. Now, granted, we lived out in the, in the country, and so it was like, oh, okay. So I remember a few years, at, you know, we always just grew up knowing this. You know, all oh, dads working in the shop. Lights go down and up. All oh, dads up and working in the shop. And then several years later, I was uh, I was at the neighbor's house, and the lights dimmed. And I was like, "Oh man!" I I was like, "Oh, dad must be in the shop," but it was affecting the neighbors. And so this, whenever you roll something out, you think you're only affecting yourself, but realize that you could be impacting others. You just don't know. Uh, so. A lot of times in in you know cabinet making, you put together a prototype. And the one thing that my dad always did when we did this was that we'd use scrap wood because you're going to be cutting things, trying to put things together, and then but you might throw it away and say, oh, it's not going to work, it's not going to fit the way we want together or whatnot. So you don't want to use the good wood. It's always the scrap stuff. It's usually mismatched because then you're forced not to use what you sort of like come up with that you'll actually redo it right. So you're sort of, you know, you're making sure that things fit together uh, before committing to it. Um, you know, do your line, do the cuts line up. Um, if you have cabinets that are going in the corners, can you open up both sides without the doors hitting each other and things like that? So you're, you're figuring these things out uh, in your prototype, much like software prototypes. And this, this quote always stuck with me as well. It's much easier to fix your problems before they come, become glue-covered problems. 
you put them together, if you put your prototype together and it's so, you know, it's all glued together and stuff and doesn't work, then you're having to pry it apart in the glue. You're mainly going to strip things apart. Um, so going back to this one is a common thing you do is dry fit things together. It's loosely coupled, seeing that all the pieces fit together, and and then you then you move on after it after you notice that, see that everything fits together. Then you start gluing it together. Then you start having a, instead of a loosely coupled system, you're starting to tightly couple the system together. So. This is a jig, not a dance, but a, a jig. This is um, this is what uh, used frequently in uh, you know in woodworking when you're doing cuts. If you cut one piece, if you're cutting one piece of wood, you just cut, you measure it, and you cut a piece, you cut the piece of wood. Uh, if you're cutting two pieces that need to be the same length, you measure and cut one. You make the cut. You grab the piece of wood, you throw the, the original piece on top of it, and then you line it up, and then you cut again so that they're both exactly the same, um, the same size. Now, if you need more than that, this is where the jig comes into, the, come into play. What you do is you line and measure it up um, and have this stop, and when, you, when you're on the saw, you slide a piece of wood in, you cut. Um, so you set up the jig, you do the measurement, you go and get a piece of scrap wood, you measure it, you cut it, and then you measure it again, make sure it's the right size. Once you know that your jig's in the right place, you sit there and can start going through and making how many cuts you need to make, whether it's eight, 10, 100 cuts. But once you've done all that work up front and doing that time, you can sit there and just go on autopilot. You don't have to think about it. It just because you don't have to think about it. And that was the thing. Uh, of doing it, you could uh, on there. So when I got into configuration management, it was you know other people were sitting there saying about, oh well, you're spending all this time, you know, getting this configuration management. You could have just done it real quickly here. But being doing this, I understood the importance of the automation of doing that upfront work, so that you could go on autopilot when you started doing the work. So, yeah, it, this taught me, this is the first thing I taught me was the uh, importance of automation. So this summer, this past summer, I was with my, my son at a um, Boy Scout summer camp, and there was, uh, we're at this place, and it was a lake, and there was 300 uh, 13 to 18 year old boys uh, at the summer camp and we were doing the adults that went along we were doing a bunch of projects and this is one of them one of the ones we did we made this towel rack and so before they go swimming in the lake they'll drop their towels hang it over hang it over these bars and stuff but you know you look at this and we built it and it's sort of like overkill if you can kind of look at that there's three, six, you know, there's probably 25 screws on each side um, holding this thing together. A towel's not that heavy. Even a wet towel's not that heavy. However, you've got 13, you know, you've got 13 to 8 year, 18 year old boys. You don't think that somebody's going to go up there and try to start doing pull ups on this thing? You have to realize when you're building things that things might get abused and taken into the mind. Because if we didn't, and we said, oh, well, towels can only have this much weight, and we'll just put a couple screws up there and call it good. The first kid that's going to go up there and do a pull-up is going to break it and, and ruin it. So you have to kind of think about how things might get abused. At the summer camp, they had the woodworking merit badge that they were allowing all the boys for boys to take. And so their project was making picnic tables. So I came in, and I came in and asked, you know, are there any projects that we can do, um, you know, to help out the adults? And they said, do you want to fix some picnic tables? So I'm like, okay, so I fixed up some of the picnic tables. 
the boys were making them. And the, the form was, was nice. You can kind of see from this um, that I had to do some adjustments on there. But, you know, um, I sort of raised up the bar. You can see where originally the uh, bolt bolts were for the cross piece. I mean, it was a picnic table. <laughs> it was a picnic table. It's just when you sat on it, your, your, your chin was resting on here. It wasn't the right height. Now, functionally, it was a picnic table. It just needed adjustment. And so this idea, uh, to me, is uh, was really just about the form was there, um, and you just had to adjust it. And is it the prettiest thing? No, but it's a picnic table. It's sitting out in the weather, and it's going to be you know rotted out in a few years anyways. It's getting the form over the, um, you know, uh, don't worry about perfection. You can adjust things. Um, once it's built and it doesn't have to, it doesn't affect the form or the purpose of, of what you're building. We built this gate and um, I wish I had a, actually a, a little bit of a better picture on here. Um, but there's these wires that are coming up from the gate and we've got them twisted and stuff such that it's self-closing. They would open it up the gate up, and then you'd let, it, let them go and they self-close back. It was really kind of a really cool engineered thing that we um, we built for the, the, the gate. Um, this was coming into the lake. This is where they brought the, um, the trailers with the boats in and out of the lake. And, uh, you know, it had a had a latch on the gate. And one of the boys came up after we had built this, oh, that's like really cool, and it's like, well, what if somebody leans up on the gate? Uh, it's going to bust that. It's going to bust that latch off. You made this cool gate, but it's going to get ruined. I'm like, well, how would you fix that? So I had this 14 year old boy said, well, you could put a stop in it, like a door latch. And he came up with this. He went off into the shop and actually sort of engineered the solution up. And this is just rebar that he put into a vise and and bent over and put through a couple of eye hooks down into the ground and into the ground it was just a piece of pipe that he small piece of pipe that he found that he took a sledgehammer and pounded into the ground he goes there it works it, it you fix the problem so it's this really is a representation for me of utility over form that um, and also kind of be surprised about um, what your junior members uh, of the team will come up with. Uh, another thing that years ago I had a, a, uh, a vice president of mine talk about uh, what he called the simplicity principle, which was it should be really easy to do the right thing. It should be really difficult to do the wrong thing. Uh, and just using this as, a, as an overall design you know, a guiding principle over designing software and software systems. Um, this had a good representation in, in woodworking. There's there's guards on saws. So you don't put your fingers into the saws. You can, you can. It, it's really easy. I mean, they're just. It's always there. Um, you can take the guards off, but it's really hard to do that. You have to assemble half of half of the saw in order to remove the guards. So again, it's it's difficult to do. It makes it difficult to do the wrong thing. But think about that when you're designing systems. The other thing that I, I learned out of my life um, is the, the idea of being poised for success. Whenever you're going in and you're talking about a transformation, uh, you know, you have to be ready to show people uh, what, you know, the, the power, the benefit. Um, of what you're trying to espouse to people. So some, I, I actually gave um, this, this, this story, and it's actually been um, at, a, at a chef, uh, I think it was at a, at a chef summit, and the salespeople picked up and started using this story, and I remember a salesperson came around to me and was, you know, had gone through the grapevine, and he was telling me the story, and I'm like, that's my story, but it's, it's kind of a fun thing. I don't know if people remember Shell Shock. Um, so this was early in, uh, in my uh, companies, we were um, going to 
um, bringing in Chef, Chef on board. And Shell Shock was a vulnerability in Bash, and everybody had to had to um, upgrade Bash. And there, uh, so we're on this big call, and we had an, a, an existing data center design that was NFS Discos Images, and different teams were responsible for the different data centers. And the new, our, my new team was doing Chef. So they're in this meeting. They said, oh, we got to upgrade Bash. So I coded up the recipe, tested it under Vagrant on my laptop, all while in this meeting, went out and got a code review, got it pushed out to the new data center they were pushing, and they came along to me and said, so they said, okay, so how long is it going to be for you to get an estimate of when you're going to be done? I'm like, I'm done. And it's like, okay, well, how long? And I'm like, no, I'm done. I've rolled out to the new data center the change, we're already upgraded, vulnerability, uh, you know, done. So the uh, for that piece of it, after that meeting, everybody's like, hmm, what's this chef stuff? So I was poised for success. It was like, there was a perfect opportunity to show what um, what the idea that you're trying to go with, push forward. Uh, I'm going to leave you with a quote from Steve Jobs. Uh, this was given at his, uh, the, I, uh, the commencement address he gave at uh, Stanford University, uh, and this is kind of the, the flow of my talk, is just, you cannot connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect them looking backwards to see this step led me to here, which led me to here. So hopefully you'll look back and see that here DevOps State Galway was one of the dots on your journey um, to success. So thank you.